Matt, hello. Welcome onto the podcast. Yeah, hello. It's awesome to be here, by the way. Um, I'm an English teacher, and so you have no idea how many times um, my students mention your name here and there. So it's really? strange to speak to you. Yeah. Randomly pops up. Have you heard that podcast with Luke? <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Well, how nice. It's weird. People say that to me every now and then. Um, and I'm, I'm always kind of like, what, really? You know? yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I know that people out there listen to my podcast, but then sometimes when someone says that, like a person mm -hmm. says, oh, yeah, people mention your podcast all the time. I'm kind of we're like, what, really? People are actually talking about it? I should yeah. know after it's been 12 years, you know. I suppose I am speaking with English learners all day, so it's not like it comes up in a cafe with a random person, but... <laughs> But yeah, it's not like you're in a taxi in London and the dri taxi driver. So, have you listened to that Luke English podcast? Very good. <laughs> right. But yeah. <laughs> so, Matt, 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 let me ask you the sort of basic um, questions just to get to know you. So, uh, where are you from? How long have you been teaching? Uh, and so on. So, we'll start with where are you from? Where are you from? Where am I from? That's always an interesting question. So, where was I born? I was born in California. Um, I'm from Southern California. That's where I grew up. I went to, to college, to university and everything. Um, yeah, but then when I was around 20, in my early 20s, um, I started traveling and I moved to Europe kind of spontaneously without a plan. Um, and I've been here for what, since 2004? So almost 20 years, a little under 20 years. Yeah, I'm in Italy, in the Northwest of Italy. Um, I lived in Germany for six and a half years, and then here in Italy, and I've been teaching that whole time, teaching English. Yeah, fantastic. That's great. Wonderful. What what's what's so appealing about uh, Europe or Italy more specifically? <laughs> um, you know, I think every place has their some adv advantages and disadvantages, right? Um, yeah, mm -hmm. why did I come to Italy at the beginning? I was very young. I came because I was interested in history, traveling. I love culture. And honestly, in my early 20s, I thought the girls were really pretty in Italy. <laughs> I suppose that had they something are, to I mean, do you with still it. Think yeah? they're, you still think they're pretty? Yeah, my wife's Italian, so I guess we can confirm that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. So it wasn't planned, let's say. That was spontaneous. I had gone to university to be a teacher. I'm originally an elementary school teacher. That was my plan. Um, but at that point in my life, I hadn't started doing that. I had a chance to travel. And I think that was the best education I ever got, honestly, was traveling around a bit. Yeah, yeah. me too. Traveling, teaching English to people from around the world. Yeah, totally. It just uh, really helped me in many ways. It gave me skills and things, communication skills and more. Right. Yeah. And you know Christian Saunders, yeah. um, you work together on the project that we're going to talk about. How do you know Christian? So Christian from Kanguro English, which he's been on your podcast, what, two times, I think? And I'm sure a lot of people mm -hmm. know him. Mm -hmm. um, I knew him as well, just as a YouTube viewer, I guess. That may sound strange because you would think, why is an English teacher watching other English teaching channels, <laughs> right? Um, but... Yeah. Maybe because I need to improve my English, but mostly because Christian has a lot of content there where he speaks to linguists. It's He speaks to people in the industry. And um, yeah, whenever I, I saw these videos, I just was nodding my head a lot and like, yeah, I, I really agree with this guy. And he has the same hairstyle as I do. Maybe that brought me to him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um yeah, then one day I saw him reading the dictionary for 20 hours or whatever it was. He was doing this thing of raising money and reading the dictionary. And yeah, I saw he started this charity project where he was raising money to build a school in, in Laos. And basically, I thought that was cool. And I got in contact with him in a roundabout way. And I said, uh, yeah, if you need any other teachers to help volunteer for this thing you're doing, I'm here if you want. And yeah, I started volunteering for this group he has, and that's how we got to know each other. And eventually that's how we got into this project together. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. So the project that we're going to talk about is called the Travel Adapter. Um, so what is it? What What is this project then? Tell us about the Travel Adapter. Yeah. 
So I think the best way to explain this is maybe to describe a situation, which I think a lot of the people mm -hmm. listening to this are learning English and they may have experienced this situation. So this is about native speakers adapting their English to an international group. But, but let me give you an image or paint a picture. Yeah, create an image. Um, think that we're sitting in an international meeting, right? And we have two people from Italy, two from France, two from Brazil, and they're communicating together. Um, there are grammar mistakes flying around this room everywhere. <laughs> people are using <laughs> their own. Saying, I am agree. <laughs> right. And uh, it depends it depends of and all those classic mistakes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I presentate. I presented this yesterday. Whatever. <laughs> um, there are lots of mistakes going on, but so what? This isn't an English class. This isn't a standardized test. These people are just trying to communicate as fast as they can, probably because it's a work situation, and they're doing a good job. Yeah. They they understand each other. They find their way without a lot of problems most of the time. Despite the, the so-called mistakes, they are able to understand each other fine. Yeah. Right. They're focused on communication, which should be always our, our first goal. And it's working, right? But mm -hmm. then let's imagine we have two people join the meeting, the Zoom meeting, um, and one's from, I don't know, from the UK and one's from California. Okay. <laughs> and these two people join. It's you and, and what, me, basically. We join the meeting. Yeah. yeah. We heard that you're having a successful meeting. We need to stop that. Yes. <laughs> we jump in, and basically what happens, it gets quiet. Everyone gets quiet. People start to mute their microphones sometimes. If we could observe them, probably people close their eyes, and they lean in towards their computer a little, a little as they try to understand. And the native speakers start to confuse people more than anyone else. And because of that, they start to dominate the call, probably. and. They make a joke and only 20% of the people understand. Um, the native speakers basically are doing a lot of complex things that are confusing everyone. And this travel after travel adapter <laughs> idea is basically about helping them learn how to adapt to an international environment because uh, research has shown and I imagine you as an English teacher maybe have seen this in your own experience that some of the worst communicators out there in an English environment group, an international group of people speaking English, very often are, are you and me, are us, <laughs> are the native speakers. So that's what this project is about. Yeah. So what is it that native speakers do wrong then? I mean, okay, we, we should probably address already at the beginning. I was going to address this question later, but it's already in my mind, mm -hmm. which is the question of who is it that has the responsibility for uh, a successful communication in this situation? And if English is the language that's being spoken, surely it should be the people who are learning it who have the responsibility to sort of get their English up to a decent level so that communication can be successful. Those are questions that uh, I, I just feel like I should put on the table right now because people will be thinking of them. So who's responsible for the successful communication and shouldn't the learners of English learn English rather than the native speakers sort of simplifying their English and simplifying the English language? Yeah. Hmm. A few things. I think it's a good question and we should speak about it. I don't think it's about simplifying as well, which is another thing, but we can come back to that. Um, but it's communication, right? And communication is always a two-way dance. It's always a two-way thing. I think it's both of our responsibilities. And the English learner should, of course, work on their English, learn as much as they can. And in fact, they're already doing that. I think most of the people listening to this have already spent hundreds, if not thousands of hours, probably working on their English to improve their English. And if there's a gap in the middle, let's say we're, we're having miscommunication, right? Um, yeah, the, the English learners are building a bridge over this gap. It's like in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. There's a long bridge <laughs> that goes across a big gap. Yeah. And the English learners have, are building a bridge. They've been doing that all their lives. As they're working, there's on crocodiles their at the bottom as, as yeah. well. Don't forget, there's a lot man-eating crocodiles down there too. So if the bridge d fails, then everyone's going to get eaten. Yes. So this is important. Yeah. 
we're all going to die or we'll get fired or we're going to have some big problem <laughs> in a relationship or whatever <laughs> it is. Um, the, the challenge is most of the time what's going on, though, and I don't think the native speakers are doing this out of, you know, malice, which means to be evil or <laughs> mean or yeah. something um, or or anything like that. But most of the time, they're just sitting on their side of the canyon or the, the river, whatever it is, and they're just hanging out. So they're just waiting <laughs> for the English learner to come over. And I think it's fair. It, it is fair. It's, it would, it's equal <laughs> that they're at least putting a hand out. Maybe they're even building a little bit, a bridge to meet in the middle. And yeah, so I think it's both of our responsibility. Should be anyways. I don't yes. know if it is today in, in many conversations, but it should be, I think. Mm -hmm. We can come yeah. back to some of the wider issues and stuff later. I think my original question, <clears throat> before, my, before I change my mind, the original question I think was, what is it specifically that native speakers are doing? So first of all, yes, they're not sort of, as you say, extending a hand or building the bridge to meet in the middle. But are there any sort of specific uh, language related things that native speakers do that make things complicated for learners of English or non-native yeah. speakers? I think we're doing a lot of things without realizing it. That's the thing. We're just unaware of it um, for many other reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so just let's give an example. Let's, let's take one example, but there are many. So it's not just that we are speaking too fast. That could be a point, could be. It could be that we have a strong regional accent and we're not, uh, let's say, changing that a little bit. But those aren't the only reasons, okay? Another example could be that we use uh, lots of idioms, so lots of expressions that are really confusing. And if we just use a, let's use a sports idiom, for example, like as an American, mm -hmm. I might say, um, I'll take a rain check on that, okay? What the hell does that mean? <laughs> okay, it means something very, <laughs> do you even know that one? <laughs> If I say I'll take a no, rain well, check. I've heard that many times. Yeah, I've, I've heard it many, many times. In fact, with my friends, we find it to be kind of a kind of a funny phrase and we use it. It's like, let me take a rain check. And like, what is a rain check? I've no idea. Are you checking the rain? Yeah, what, what does that mean, I don't right? understand it. And what that is, is that it comes from the game of baseball, of American baseball, and a cultural thing from history. And if it was raining, they would cancel the game. So they gave you a paper and you could come back to a, a future game for free, basically. Okay. Okay. So it's like a refund. Oh, the check is literally the, the paper. sorry, the piece of paper uh, with the that's like a ticket. I like see a ticket. A rain you could check. come back if it's a rainy day. Okay. But I so see. that's just an expression that maybe an American might use. The thing is, in our first language, and this is valid for any first language, by the way, not only English. In our first language, we use a lot of complex vocabulary expressions idioms like that, things referencing our culture. Um, and we don't think about it because of course we're just speaking fluently. Um, but those are really complex for people learning English. I mean, how many idioms are in the English language and everyone is learning those, but there are thousands of them to learn, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And even between us, between a, an American speaker and somebody from the UK, we also have sometimes some confusions there. So if you use a cricket reference with me or an idiom, I, I may have no idea what it means as well, right? Absolutely. We would joke so, about it, but... <laughs> yeah, I might yeah. use a cricket. I mean, I, um, I did an episode with my cousin uh, who lives in California, actually. Um, he works in a company out there. And it was all about just moments when he said things and all the all his American colleagues have kind of gone, what? What do you want about? Right. Like even stuff like idioms, which we both understand, but which are just not used. For example, he says, yeah, yeah, you know, I'm on the case. Don't worry, guys, I'm on the case. Mm -hmm. I'm on the case, meaning I'm going to deal with it. But apparently his American colleagues are like, what, you're on the case? Like Sherlock Holmes? Yeah. You know, they're, they, they a detective <laughs> they that when sort I hear of that. Funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. a detective investigating rather than just someone who is taking responsibility for something. So, yes, even between British and American English, uh, we d the idioms do cause confusion, certainly, yeah. Right. Sometimes. Um, part of this travel adapter thing is trying to take to, to 
let's say train, or I don't know if train is the right word, but help the native speaker adapt and just be aware of that because most of us are not. So um, instead of saying, I'll take a rain check on that, I should say in an international group, something like, um, yeah, I'll return to that later. Or I'll come back to you, what, whatever. I explain it in another way that's just simpler in an in a international group. It's easier to understand. Or maybe I check, do you know this expression? Have you ever heard this? <laughs> and then I, I check, do you know what it means to be on the case? And the guy will probably say no. And then I can explain it if I want to. Yeah. That's right. I mean, as English teachers for you know long time, we've slowly just developed these skills bit by bit where right. you just naturally learn how to grade your English and you know communicate with people who, who are learning the language. But yes, it's something that most, I guess, most native speakers, unless they are, unless they've had a long career internationally, a lot of native speakers don't have to consider those things. And then when they suddenly are all thrown into a meeting together, yeah, that's when things start to get a bit uh, complicated. Right. Where did you learn this from? I, you learned this from from teaching, I suppose. I, I did as well. Yeah. That you would just say something and nobody would understand you. You see it in their faces or you <laughs> you hear it and you develop oh, yeah. over a lot of time a kind of filter or radar or something in front of you that's there's this idiom coming towards you and you uh you take it and you adapt it or you avoid it yeah and mm -hmm. i don't think that native speakers most native speakers have ever had that experience mainly because they have never learned another language okay um yeah and they haven't been in the international and, environment to to pick it up. Yeah, that's right. A lot of native speakers have got no idea what uh, these non-native speakers are actually going through and what it feels like to be in that situation where you, you're in a meeting trying to do it in another language. I mean, mm -hmm. most native speakers are spoiled by the by privilege, by the fact that English is the uh, is the lingua franca. And so then you know, English people or American people don't really feel the need to learn languages. And so they are not very, I wouldn't say it's, it's not the word sympathetic, but they just don't really know what the other people are going through, that right. how, how, uh, how much pressure and how, uh, uh, horrible it can be yeah. when you're trying to communicate in another language. They've never yeah. had that experience, right? Which I think both of us have had, you've had it with French, right? I've had it with Italian or German. Mm -hmm. And all of our English learners have had it where you're sitting with a group and you just don't understand, or maybe you do, but you're too slow to speak. So you feel very frustrated. And that feeling yes. is a really important feeling to experience. And we need to remember that most native English speakers simply have never, they've never had that feeling. Um, yeah. They're just not yeah, aware of it. Exactly. They could imagine it, but they're just not aware of it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, it is an, a thing to experience. I mean, again, you can imagine it, but actually experiencing it is quite a visceral feeling of confusion and doubt and suddenly a lot of pressure. Like you talked about building the bridge, like learners of English definitely take a ton of responsibility because they feel really self-conscious about their English. They feel a great deal of pressure uh, to, to understand and to be understood and all these, these strong feelings, whereas native speakers just like, oh, it's just another day at the office. You know, they don't sort of feel the same level of, of pressure. Right. Also, I think that native speakers don't always know, as you said, I mean, there's the idioms and stuff, but there are other things too right. that native speakers might not realize what it is about English that's difficult. Right. right? I think another reason uh, here why we are bad at maybe what we're not very good at adapting, right? Um, not only have we never learned another language, but most English speakers have never learned very much about English itself. <laughs> and um, because in our school system, we don't study. I think it's shocking for many of my Italian students to or German students to hear that, yeah, I never studied grammar in my school in the US and I went to university and all, you know, um, we never spoke about present perfect. Um, even if you even if I wanted to adapt my grammar, let me say, I've never learned my own grammar. <laughs> so that's also another challenge mm -hmm. and another reason why it's maybe hard to adapt. So another problem, another challenge that we present very often are using phrasal verbs 
right? And every English learner knows phrasal verbs can make you go crazy. <laughs> it's give in, give up, give out. <laughs> oh my God, I have to put this together like two Legos and make a, you know, match that together. That's something that's really complex about the English language for most learners. And um, as an English speaker, I think most English speakers have no idea what a phrasal verb is. <laughs> no. So, no. So if I tell you, don't use phrasal verbs, try to avoid them because they're very confusing. Yeah, that's really hard because the English speaker doesn't even know what a phrasal verb is really. And yeah. also the thing about phrasal verbs is that some native speakers might assume that those phrases are easier than their equivalents because what it, the way it works with, nat with uh, phrasal verbs is that usually you've got, in English, you've got the phrasal verb and then the sort of uh, single verb equivalent and the single verb equivalent is often going to be a longer verb, probably with a Latin origin mm. and a bit more formal. So you've got, let's say, formal and informal. And I mean, it's a bit basic to say it, but often the phrasal verbs are slightly less formal and they have a short verb and then a, some kind of particle. And the short verbs are typically things like get or pick or you know, um, run or short little words like that. Mm -hmm. And then the other ones are the more difficult words. Right. But certainly if you are speaking to people who have, you know, uh, if, if you're speaking to French or Italian or Portuguese speakers, um, those quote unquote difficult words are actually the easier words for them. Right. Uh, but an, a native speaker might assume, well, if I am using these little words like cut, pick, get, and so on, that that is easier. But if, you know, if you're filling your English with what, I guess, what you could describe as delexicalized verbs, verbs that don't have a lot of clear meaning, verbs that could mean anything, if you just, you know, depending on the way you combine them with other words that could mean anything. So if you're using phrases like get into, get through to, get, uh, you know, get around to, uh, copy me in on, you know, all those sorts of things, then Again, a native speaker might assume that the, the short words are the simple words, these are the easy words, and the big words are complicated. But actually, it's the other way around a lot of the yeah. time. A lot of learners of English need those big words because those are the ones that are the same in their language. In right. Many cases. I completely agree. And if we think when we speak to children in, the U in, in English countries, English monolingual countries, we use that like give up, you know, don't give up. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe I should say, you know, don't stop trying, don't surrender, whatever surrender, whatever the, the longer version would be. But yeah. we wouldn't say that normally. We would normally, in our spoken English, use the, the phrasal verb option. And that's why all of everyone is learning phrasal verbs all the time. And you'll probably be doing that the rest of your life. And that's okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, in my opinion, if, if we're in an international group and Everyone is using the word like distribute and not hand out or whatever it may be. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. If we as a native speaker can not always, but sometimes adapt our language, we would be easier to understand. Okay. Or even, even just if you, if those native speakers understand that this room of people, they're going to understand distribute. They're not going to understand hand out, but distribute, uh, but hand out is the phrase. So in a way, it's like native speakers as custodians of this language we also have to be a bit like english teachers everyone has to suddenly take on that responsibility so you would say let me just distribute these or actually we'd probably say let me just hand these out to you i'm just going to hand out these things uh, being aware of it that they understand distribute but you don't want to use distribute because right. it sounds too formal right and so you say hand out you know sometimes just that awareness can feed into your communication where you are looking at the language, sort of the metacognitive side of it, you know, where you kind of are aware of the language that you're using, that can make a huge difference to being uh, understandable. You know, Huge difference. I think that little explaining, let's say, maybe if I'm aware of these things, I use it naturally, but when I catch myself using it, I just have a one second explanation <laughs> of whatever that means, or I check with my listeners, is that clear? Do you guys know that? Or um, 
Is it all good? And yeah. the, you know, what do you understand by that? I, I ask them or I rephrase it as I'm speaking. And that makes me so much more friendly. It makes me so much more fair in a way um, in this conversation because I'm meeting people again in the middle. I'm adapting. Okay. Yeah. We talked about one of the reasons why native speakers don't adapt and it's because they uh, aren't aware of what the, their counterparts are going through because they haven't learned the language they don't know english very well themselves but are there any other reasons why native speakers might be reluctant to adapt their speech let's see um i think mostly in my experience with working with some native speakers it comes down to just being unaware because most people actually want to help. I mean, they want to communicate. And if they also see that they can adapt their language and, and it will go faster, I mean, that's better for them. So I think it's mostly down to unawareness, though I'm sure that there are some people out there who like to have the power. <laughs> because if you have the power of the language, let's say in a business meeting, I have a lot of power in many ways. I can push you into a corner and block you into a way and make you feel frustrated and low and make you feel like you're not very intelligent because of the language. And I could use that as a weapon. Okay, we can use our language as a very, very powerful weapon. So are there people doing that? Probably. I imagine in some negotiations there could be, but I don't think that's the main thing Absolutely. going on. I also think that, that to an extent native speakers uh, don't want to simplify their speech and they don't, well, I say simplify. Yeah. They don't want to simplify their speech. They don't want to explain things because they don't want to put the other person out, meaning they don't mm. want to seem patronizing they don't want it to seem, yeah, mainly patronizing. And I've mm -hmm. seen this from native speakers communicating with non-native speakers. And the non-native speakers are desperate for these native speakers to maybe speak more slowly or just to be a bit more clear, just to help in the communication. And they don't. And, and the learners of English get so frustrated. Why don't English people make more of an effort mm -hmm. to communicate? And I think it's because they, the English speakers are self-conscious and they don't want to seem patronizing or rude it would be quite rude for me to talk to you like you know do you understand what i'm saying you know that uh, native speakers perhaps don't want to come across as this kind of patronizing rude person but right. in fact it's much more helpful than it is offensive i think there's a balance there and i think speaking about that feeling is correct because um if you exaggerate this if you go too far let's say you you could run into that feeling but I'd also say it's from the second language speaker there of English to they need to speak together and find their good level. <laughs> so, okay. um, yeah. you know, it's if I think he's patronizing me, I mean, maybe he's actually trying to help you in a way and he's just unaware of how to do it, maybe. <laughs> so I think that there needs to be some. Well, it's helpful if there's communication between the two to find the good, the good space. Um, yeah. But we need to be aware of that. I don't want to call some, maybe in someone's culture as well. In some cultures, there's an idea kind of a face or having, a, you know, looking good. We all want to look good in front of our boss if the boss is in the room. <laughs> so I, if I ask someone, did you understand that phrase? They're probably going to say yes, <laughs> even if they didn't. Okay. Certainly in, in, in some cultures. Yeah, definitely. So there needs to be a balance there. And I think just having that communication between both sides and um, finding the good place, the, the good space, it is like an adapter. That's why we try to use this idea of an adapter. So I need to read the person in front of me, maybe in this case, find a little bit their English level or the group's level and adapt correctly to that level. We adapt all the time. I mean, think about when you speak to, you have a, a, a child, right? A small child. Yeah, How old I do. Yeah, your child, three or four, she's, right? She's three. She's three. 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 three and well, let's half. say when you're speaking yeah. to your when you're speaking to your daughter, you speak in one way. When you speak to a waiter, you speak to them in one way. When you speak to your boss, we speak to them in another way. At a football stadium, we speak in another way. We're always adapting our language all the time in our first language, depending on where we are and who's around us. And this is just another setting, if you want, on this adapter. So I don't think it's just simplifying your language. Would you say we simplify our language when we speak to children? 
I don't know, maybe we do in some ways, but we adapt to them, right? Yes. And we change the, change our intonation when we talk to children. Everything sort of becomes a lot more, you know, everything gets higher. Gets higher. <laughs> it's like uh, a totally different type of talking. Yeah. So I think that, um, yeah, in this case, if we can avoid patronizing by adapting to to the right level, but we need to know how to to read the level a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Do you find that, I mean, uh, where are you with the project at this point? I mean, have you actually started training people with this yeah. or is it? Yeah. So where with are you Christian, we, we, we built this together. Let's say it came from multiple sources, it's something I'm very interested. He's interested in there's, there's research on this as well. Um, we put that together and we've created a workshop. We have a, a free pamphlet that has a, a lot of tips for native speakers, but we've run a few workshops with it as well with native speakers. And um, it's very interesting to do that because I don't know, Luke, if you realize as an English teacher, you're really, really an expert at this. <laughs> so um, <laughs> if you just take a group of random English speakers and you start to speak about this, yeah, they're interested in it. Most of them are interested in it and they're, they're quite unaware, I'd say, of how to adapt. What are some of the typical things that people have said in workshops? Things like, um, oh, I never realized that. <laughs> oh, that's not so difficult. I just need to be aware of it or that opened my eyes a little bit. Things like this. Okay. I've also heard, I felt like I was speaking to them as a child. One woman said, and you know, in the past I had to do an international thing and the, the interpreter told me to corrected me a little bit <laughs> and told me to simplify. And she said, I felt like I was patronizing them. Like I was speaking to children, you know, I, I didn't want to do that. Mm. Um, but now I see maybe I wasn't, that, that feeling wasn't exactly right. I, I was adapting my language to the group in a good way. Yeah. That, 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 uh, thing about adapting, especially to lower level people can be, you're right. It can be very difficult. And I suppose it's one of the things I've developed over the 20 years of teaching, but it, I, I actually thinking back at my teaching career, I think there were certain little breakthroughs, you know, you have little breakthroughs in your teaching where you feel like you've made progress. And I definitely remember one of the breakthroughs I made was when I learned how to talk to lower level students without felt feeling like I was patronizing them hmm. and it takes a while where you can sort of speak in quite a serious way about serious things uh, but you've learned how to adapt your English and so and that's great like the, the learners absolutely love it they love it when you are able to talk to them clearly without it being patronizing because it does happen it does happen a lot that people will like and I've seen English teachers do this they're teaching lower level students. So that automatically they start to kind of baby them. Mm. And it's like the way they communicate with them is it, they slip into that child speak or whatever it is. And that's, that's horrible. That must be horrible for the learners as well. But mm. yeah, there's a, there's, it's a different thing talking simply and clearly. I don't I keep saying simple, but I mean, just um, you, I choosing think you your can, words. I think you can communicate really high level things. And if we look in history, we could look at many examples, really deep, high level things using simple language, using short, compact language, not just adding in a lot of, sorry for the bad word, bullshit <laughs> or extra things yeah. that we don't need to put in there that are, why are they there? Maybe it's just to show that I'm smart or something. It maybe takes away from the message. So a lot of the times in real life communication, we don't need that, that extra fluff if you want. It depends always on our situation. It depends what we're doing, where we are. Am I speaking in front of a, a university or am I speaking to my colleague? But most of the time we're just speaking with other friends, colleagues, coworkers, things like that. And so- And it's not just about the words that you use, about all the other stuff, all that nonverbal communication, all those other things. Like, um, again, I, you know, thinking about myself in classes, uh, um, it's about sort of really engaging with the people you're talking to mm -hmm. and making eye contact with them and listening to them very carefully. Um, about really making that extra effort to engage with the people you're with rather than just thinking, if I just choose the right words and put them in the right order, 
that communication will succeed. It's not just the right words in the right order. It's about creating a connection with the people you're talking to and uh, on a human level, you know, and yeah. um, so those things. And I think, the again, the awareness of what other people are going through when they're trying to speak your language helps to humanize you and then helps you to sort of essentially um, kind of get closer to the people you're talking to and uh, think about them and sympathize with them and, and, and so on. I think it generally makes people more thoughtful. Um, I expect it's a human connection, as you said, this human connection, that's the key there. I mean, I don't think we'll get this patronizing feeling if I'm being authentic and it's clear that, um, I respect you and I understand how, fr how difficult this can be. And I'm, I'm here to support you basically. Um, I think then we, we don't have to worry too much about the patronizing thing if I'm being authentic and human. Yeah. <laughs> I think that, that yeah, and, voids and a lot of that. Showing respect as well. Showing respect. I think, you know, I don't know. What do you think about even native speakers saying, you know, thank you very much for doing this in English. I really appreciate it. I feel like that would be a good thing to do probably. Little things like that are gold for anyone learning a language. I mean, if someone said that to me as I was trying to learn Italian or German, um, yeah. that just gives you such a smile It because you're doing so much work, um, but it's often unseen. Okay. Or you may feel like it's just yeah. expected somehow, but actually you're doing really, really a lot of work guys to learn a language is extremely complex. It's one of the biggest things you could attack or try to learn in the world. I think there's so much inside of it. Um, so little comments like that are really, really helpful. Little comments for a native speaker at the beginning of the meeting, like, Let's, okay, if I'm speaking with a mixed group, okay, let's remember everyone, we're in an international group, let's slow down a little bit. Just little comments like that really, really go a long way. Yeah. Yeah, and even I hope you understand me. Please ask me if you'd like to, if you'd like me to repeat something. And there are many other things which I'm sure that you cover in, in, in your project. You know, it's also about things like um, perhaps summarizing things yeah. Yeah. that you've said right sort of clarifying by summing up mm -hmm. one um very helpful thing to do in general as speaking um as a native english speaker in an international group would be to rephrase things to use something called signposting which may be a new word for many people think of a signpost is that stick in the road <laughs> that tells you paris is in 100 kilometers or what yeah when I'm speaking, if I do that, I say, you know, first we're going to speak about this, um, then, I, then I speak about it. At the end, I say, okay, now we're done speaking about this, let's move on. I'm thinking in a business context here, okay? Um, let me summarize what we agreed on. Let me summarize what we said to be sure that it's okay. Every time I do that, I give a, a chance, I give a hand, I open a door, for anyone who didn't understand me to come in. I'm kind of giving them the map, if you want, yeah. before we speak. And it's so helpful to do that. It's incredibly powerful to do that. So add in those phrases. I would add as well, even, I mean, just thinking back to my experiences as a teacher, that one of the most useful things is to to write the occasional word up on a screen or a board or something like that. Um, and also to pay a lot of attention to the people you're talking to. So I will talk to my groups and I can just smell it because I, yeah. as a teacher, you know, yeah. I've just learned that you can just, you can smell when they haven't understood something, you know, you just say something and then none of you understood that, did you? And then you have to go through it again. And sometimes the only thing they need is for the word to be written. Right. Just that one word that they didn't get, just write it. And then they go, oh, like that. And they all then understand it. They know the word. It's just the way it's being said that right. that has, um, you know, stumped them, to use a cricketing phrase. Yeah, stump them. So how could you adapt that to an international group? What does to stump someone mean? Stump. <laughs> to stump someone. That's That's what's confused them or that's what has been very difficult for them. Right. And we do this all the time. I'm sure we have done it within our conversation here with two native speakers together. You naturally just kind of motivate, motivate each other to, to use fluent language. <laughs> so, um, 
yeah, and then we use words like that, and um, that's exactly an obstacle. It's, it's like I sometimes I think of it like in a video game where you're running, and then there are holes you have to jump over or swing on a vine <laughs> over or what, and we're just throwing in a lot of different holes. You know, there are many of them. So by doing those those signposting things, those rephrasing, by writing that word on the board, by um, doing all of those things, you're just presenting less holes to jump over, okay? What are more? There, there are many other things. Um, another one I would say is um, maybe with pronunciation, so it's just with actually our speaking. Um, some things like we should try, now we may know this, but if we actually do it is another thing. <laughs> we should try to avoid saying things like gonna when I should say going to. Or, or in it, <laughs> or um, yeah, I wanna when I could say want to. Now that's maybe not so easy to do, but that's another helpful thing. We should pronounce our consonants as well. So um, if I say next, please, but in reality, in speaking, we probably say next, please. Where'd the tea go? <laughs> I eat the tea. Next, please. <laughs> next, please. I don't say next. Next with a T, <laughs> next please, very yeah. often. So we kind of, we eat some of our consonants or we, we erase them, we, we, we take them out. And yeah, if we're aware, we may be able to put those in there. Again, not to exaggerate it, but maybe they're there. So things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, learning about how we connect all our words together how some sounds get elided yeah 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 i think that most learners of english never studied i don't have lots of english books behind me but i don't think there are chapters about wanna gonna shoulda coulda woulda coulda all of that what you mean for, for english kids <laughs> for english uh, learners kids, but... i mean someone learning english is a second language yeah um no well it's 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 not the primary thing that people learn i mean you know there's connected speech and all of the sort of features of natural english communication these are sort of in the subcategory which some youtubers describe as secrets mm -hmm. um about language right. learning not that there are any secrets of course but this is the sort of stuff that you discover when you study English to a more academic level or when you get into a more advanced level, you start to uncover these cool things like connected speech and weak forms. And uh, I, I think a lot of learners of English, certainly the ones who get to a good level, get to a, have a moment where they discover all this stuff about how the written word and the spoken word are totally different and about the ways in which like especially when you learn the phonemic script and you start to transcribe sentences into phonemic script then you start to see oh my goodness this whole sentence is more like one word really you mm -hmm. know and, and things like that um so yes it's not the stuff that learners of english get at the beginning you know most learners of english are focused on uh, grammar, vocabulary, reading, writing, you know, right. those sorts of and They may think this things. is just slang in quotations. The thing is, when we're speaking, um, even very high level speakers of English, go watch a presentation from Steve Jobs or who you want. They'll use these things. So it's not that this is slang. It's not just in the street speaking to the drug dealer <laughs> who's who are using these things. No, 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 no. <laughs> these things are being used all over the place. Okay. Yeah, honestly, absolutely. So. Um, um, it relates to writing as well. We're talking about using bullet points in emails. Yeah, there's another thing with, with emails. Use bullet points if you can. I mean, I would say to a native speaker, use bullet points when you can for so many reasons. It just simplifies things. It just generally makes things easier to read. Nobody wants to get a big, long paragraph of text they have to decipher. <laughs> I mean, even in our first language, we would prefer it to be in little chunks, probably. Um, as a second language speaker, English learner, it's, it's, e it's difficult to go through all of that. It's much easier if I have these things in bullet points where I could just have a, a quick answer, I could focus on one little piece of language. Um, it's much easier to present the language in an easier way. Here's the big thing in general. I would say to a native speaker, look, you could speak fluently. Of course you can speak fluently. It's your language, I know. <laughs> but if you're speaking in this way without adapting, 
You may have beautiful sentences coming out of your mouth that are correct, 100%, but this is beautiful gibberish. 80% of your audience doesn't understand you, sir. <laughs> and if you're speaking to an international group, I think you want them to understand you. And if only 20% of the people understand you, that's on you. Uh, sorry, it's on you. <laughs> in my job, I, I'm in multinational companies and observe a lot of real life meetings. I do a lot of observation of people. And that happens very, very often. Okay. Um, mm. At the end of the day, mm. what do you want? Do you want communication or do you want perfect English that no one understands? <laughs> okay. Absolutely. In, in the PDF that Christian sent me, which is your pamphlet, which is the, the you know, which describes uh, this whole project, and I guess people can download it. We'll find out about that in a minute. On page uh, fifty, um, there's a um, well, there's a quote. The quote says, "Needless complexity leads to negative evaluations," and apparently, in a two thousand and five uh, uh, study in Princeton. Um, the researcher wanted to know if using complex language helps you to communicate better. And he performed five different experiments, including replacing all of the nouns, verbs, and adjectives in a text with its longest entry in the thesaurus. And he discovered that when you use complex language, people rate you lower in intelligence, likability, and trustworthiness. So people think that you are less intelligent, less likable, and uh, less uh, trustworthy. Uh, and he summarized, needless complexity leads to negative evaluations. And the reason is simple. If people can't understand you, they can't understand your message. So instead of being a tool to communicate, language becomes a barrier to communication. Mm -hmm. um, right. So, Matt, have you had any kind of pushback or criticism about, uh, about this work then? A little. I think some people... Let's be honest, some people will just never adapt because they don't feel that they need to. They come from the point of view that we're speaking in English. This is my, my language in quotations <laughs> and everyone should learn it. They think it's not that difficult. You should just learn it and I'm not going to adapt. So I think there's some specific people that we may never be able to uh, convince of this, but maybe they, like to discriminate. <laughs> Maybe they are some people <laughs> just don't like foreigners. There could be many other reasons underneath that. <laughs> Language is often used yes. as a form of discrimination. So yes. And I, I think that there's some people who are in that category. Um, otherwise, yeah, I think that pushback, I think most of it comes from that direction. I think another thing that happens while doing these workshops that I've seen is that people say, they listen to this, they see this, they do some exercises, they say, yeah, it's, it's good, it's right. I need to be more aware of that. But I'm good, I don't do it anyways. <laughs> you know, I'm already <laughs> pretty good at this. The right. reality is not is there isn't, because if we actually observe them in a meeting, and sometimes in such workshops, you could have observation in their company where a trainer listens to their meeting and then they give them feedback, and you actually throw their own words back at them, they're really shocked. <laughs> so they think that really? they're not doing those things, but actually they are. They, they, so that's another thing that happens quite often. I did, I did actually receive a comment on YouTube um, in response to my most recent conversation with Christian in which we did mention this project near the end. He talked about how native speakers often are completely unaware of how bad they are at communicating with non-natives in English. And um, the comment is from Dawn Peacock. Dawn is an English teacher on YouTube, and she really enjoyed the conversation. She doesn't fit into that category of people who just take against the idea of the project, maybe for right. other uh, reasons. Dawn is, you know, she's got a different um, uh, comment here. So what she said was this. She said, I watched this about a week ago, and I'm still wondering about one thing. When you talk about training native English speakers to communicate with non-native speakers, I wonder in what contexts we would be advised to speak with fewer idioms, take time to enunciate more carefully than we would naturally, and so on. She says, it's a little unclear to me at what point the communication is considered global 
even giving a conference here in the US, so Dawn is from the States, mm -hmm. even giving a conference here in the US in a big city, a third or more of the audience might be composed of non-native speakers of English. And so, blah, 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 blah. Um, should... Um, the question is, in what situations should native English speakers simplify their language to be more comprehensive or more comprehensible to non-native speakers? Um, so, yeah, I guess the, the, the point she's making there is that um, when do you define a situation as global? When is it necessary to start adapting? Uh, because there is a grey area. Sometimes you yeah. get groups which are a mix of natives and non-natives and stuff like that. So what about that? And I, she also did mention... Doesn't it feel like as well there's a danger that if we constantly adapt, the more the global every situation becomes, the more we adapt, the more we sort of lose in terms of um, subtleties and and shades of meaning and, and the beauty of certain idioms. Hmm. So the first question is, when when should native speakers adapt? How do we know when we're in a global situation? And secondly, is this likely to have any kind of effect is it going to dumb down the language in general? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's see. So when when, when the is the situation global? I think the first question is it's not in it's not in clear thing all the time. It's just simply not easy to always know that. But I think we need to think of our audience like we we normally would. We have to look at our audience and think who are we communicating to? Who's the target of this message? Um, mm. That's the that's where I would start from then there are going to be some situations where your target may be both. <laughs> okay. And then I would probably suggest to go somewhere in the middle. Um, it's very different if I'm giving a TED talk than if I'm speaking inside of a, a Teams meeting in my company. And I think, honestly, most of the people in the world are not giving TED talks. So I don't think that situation comes up so often. <laughs> but if it does, mm -hmm. we need to think of our audience and find some balance there in the middle. And a way we might be able to accommodate that is just say, you know, um, we have this expression. I have, I use this, I like this expression. It means this. You, you just have a little maybe comment there that doesn't disturb the native speakers too much. <laughs> okay. But it, yeah. it helps. Maybe use a lot of signposting, which we should use anyways in our first language. So yeah, if I have a good structure and a good story that's, that's clear, I mean, that's going to help as well. So, yeah, often the things that say. will be um, the things that are that, what makes better communication for non-natives will often make better communi communication for natives too, because you know, keep it simple is always a, a good uh, thing to remember. And like you know, um, yeah, just basically keep it simple. Don't overcomplicate your message. Um, okay, what about the other? Thing, the which question is about dumbing down, if you want, the English. Yeah. I'm sure she doesn't mean that in a negative way, but I understand what she, she means there about losing the subtle, beautiful pieces of an idiom or an expression that you can't communicate in another way. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is the English language in general? I think we don't have any control of that anyways. Let's remember that how many English speakers, native English speakers are there in the world compared to non-native English speakers? So what, 400, 500 million, whatever it is, native speakers there are in the world, and maybe between 1 billion and 2 billion second language English speakers. The, the language is already in the global hands, okay? So I think that we don't need to worry about that. I think that you have different types of Englishes you use with different people. When you speak to your friends in a pub, you don't say um, the English language is going to be destroyed because I'm speaking this way in this one moment. <laughs> okay. Um, you're yeah. still able to yeah. adapt your language into a very beautiful flowery, flowerly <laughs> way in another situation. So I don't think that it's somehow dumbing it down that we're adapting within that moment. I think it always depends on your audience. And the language will take care of itself. <laughs> and if we lose some beautiful idiom, we'll lose it. That happens anyways, honestly. Yeah, we lose language yeah. all the time. <laughs> Things are constantly shifting. Uh, expressions are, you know, stop being used. New things come in. Other, other things go away. Yeah, it's constantly yeah. changing anyway. Yeah. 
you really feel like you need to use that beautiful idiom because you can't explain it in another way, that's fine. Cool, use it. But just be sure you check with your audience, maybe, that they understand what it means. Again, I can create a beautiful sentence that no one understands. That's not very helpful for communication. What's your goal? <laughs> if you're writing poetry is one goal, but if I'm trying to communicate, that's a different goal. So yeah. Yeah, it comes down to the old things of form and function. Things ultimately have to be functional first, um, I guess. Yes. So um, where can people find out more about this? We, we mentioned the pamphlet, the PDF that Christian sent me. Yeah, where can I people think, find out these things and so on? I think that um, probably you'll you'll link that maybe in, in the show notes here or yeah, what. I will. And if anyone wants that, it's just I will a, actually. It's a simple PDF created by Christian and myself. It's quite simple if you could flip through it really easily. And it has um, 21 tips basically for native English speakers to adapt. Um, I would say if you're working with native speakers that are difficult to understand, <laughs> a question is how would you get this into their hands? That's a difficult question <laughs> to answer. But um, this is something you could pass around. Maybe you could pass it around to others. If you're just learning English, you could still take it, maybe look at it, and you could look at this in the opposite way. Look, these are 21 obstacles that native speakers are presenting to me. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And maybe you could think, okay, I should try to work on these things. It's about meeting in the middle always. So, yeah, I think it could be used in different ways. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. Really good. Good luck with the project. And uh, really good to talk to you about all of this. And uh, well, where can, do you have a website or somewhere that people can go to find out about your work that you do online at all? Sure. I have my own little website, but it's, it's not so important. It's Coyote English. Okay. But <laughs> mm -hmm. um, that just has some vocabulary things. And I do some speaking challenges, but it's all about speaking and communicating. But um, you know what I think if someone is interested in, in exercising their English or wants to get to know me or maybe even work or have lessons with Christian and so on, would be um, this charity project that we've worked on together, his project that I joined. Um, also because these workshops that we're doing for native speakers, our plan is that the, the profit from that, if it's for a company, that goes back to this charity project, which is a really cool project about building schools in, in some countries that need them okay um so that would be somewhere to to go to do you still need uh, assistance support you know what they did we, the we did with that of course christian did most of this but he collected a community of people that are exercising their english okay so they're exercising every day in a telegram group they have different lessons with different teachers that are volunteering their time for it mm. And um, he collected, or we collected, $50,000, a lot of money, guys, to build a school in Laos. And now we're starting up on the, on the second one. Um, but more importantly, I mean, most importantly is, is those kids getting a school. But also, this was a great, fun place to exercise your English. In your English, you need everything, right? You need a mixed that diet. You need to listen to Luke's podcast. You need to watch some YouTube video. <laughs> you need to read something. You need to do a little bit of everything. <clears throat> and this is one way to exercise your speaking, I'd say. Where do people go then to, to take part in, in that group? I think they should go to Christian's website because it's through his project. So at kanguroenglish.com, I'm guessing. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's right, there. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, great. Thank you for talking to us about this, Matt. It's been it, really interesting. Can I say a final thing for all those learners out there? Um, Please do. When you don't understand, when you're frustrated, when you don't understand that American colleague who comes in, um, just remember that it may not only be you, okay? <laughs> it may not be you, okay? You have done a lot of work. You are doing a lot of work, and you're always improving your English, okay? It may be that the person in front of you isn't adapting that well. And that's nice. They need to adapt. We need to understand them in the moment. I know that's frustrating. That's difficult. I know. But just from a motivation point of view, remember that. Motivation is everything. So it's your key to learning language, as Luke says often. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Okay. 
All right, great. Well, um, good. I'll let you go then now. Have a lovely day. And um, thanks again for talking to us. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah.